This episode is brought to you by Reese's Peanut Butter Cups. In breaking news, leading scientists worldwide are conducting experiments to determine if Reese's Peanut Butter Cups are the perfect combination of peanut butter and chocolate. However, it appears the study was inconclusive, as the scientists couldn't help but eat all the Reese's. Because when you want something sweet, you can't do better than Reese's. Find Reese's now at a store near you. Fargo, the new virtual assistant from Wells Fargo, makes banking faster and easier. Like this. Fargo, what's my checking account routing number? And this. Fargo, uh, turn off my debit card. And this. Fargo, what did I spend on groceries last month? And that's just the beginning. Do you, Fargo? You can in the Wells Fargo mobile app. Learn more at wellsfargo.com slash getfargo. Terms and conditions apply. Your mobile carrier's availability and message and data rates may apply. Wells Fargo Bank and a member of DIC. Welcome to Pax Britannica. The English Conquest of Jamaica, with Professor Gardina Pestana. Today, I am delighted to speak with Carla Gardina Pestana, Distinguished Professor and Joyce Appleby Endowed Chair of America in the World at UCLA. Professor Pestana is a specialist on the English and British Atlantic world and the early United States. Her work includes the English Atlantic in an Age of Revolution, which long-time listeners might recognise since I've referred to it quite a bit, and the English Conquest of Jamaica, Oliver Cromwell's bid for empire, which listeners will hear a lot more about, both here and now, as well as when the narrative soon reaches those events. Professor Pestana, thank you so much for joining me today. You're very welcome. So, to kick things off, your career has focused on the, on the Atlantic world. I'm just curious if you could explain what was it about this field that really attracted you to it? Well, though, a lot of people will say that the field was well established before I discovered it. I did not feel that that was the case when I was groping my way toward doing it. My dissertation was on a New England topic and was narrowly defined as being about one New England colony, religious radicals in Massachusetts. And I did not, I wasn't satisfied with that as a sort of directive to a graduate student about how you went about your dissertation research in an early American history program. I found that my people in Massachusetts were connected to lots of other things going on in other places. In particular, the Quakers had lots of ties outside of not only the future United States, but also, you know, they were connected to Rhode Island, they were connected to other colonies in the region, but they were also connected, say, to Barbados, which didn't fit the way my training had led me to expect their world to look. So the second book project was me looking out from New England to think about the wider, what we now call the Atlantic world. But at the time, I referred to the project as all the English colonies in the Americas. <laughs> you know, as I was writing the English Atlantic in the Age of Revolution, I wasn't aware that I could use this term Atlantic to encompass what it was that I wanted to do. So to me, it was a problem with the kind of nationalist origins of early America and how the field was defined in my graduate training and in the training in general that people, you know, were receiving at that time to think, you know, these people are part of a larger world and I want to understand what that meant for them. And therefore, I followed that impulse into figuring out about other places that people were going from England at the same time and, you know, trying to think about their experiences collectively. So I, by the time I published the book, the word Atlantic was more prominent in the scholarship, and I quickly grabbed it to use in the title of the book. Uh, but at the time that I started working on it, I wasn't at least aware that it was, you know, I mean, the Atlantic History Group and 
in uh, that Jack Green was running at Johns Hopkins was there, but it wasn't it wasn't something that I was aware of or something that had really impacted the scholarship that I was re- reading at that time. I think it's really interesting that you say you, you started off your career with Plymouth and recently you brought out a book on the same topic, on the world of Plymouth Plantation. And <laughs> I think it's interesting that there's this there's this full circle almost there. Obviously, you'll have been touching on it, working on it throughout your career. But it's it's interesting hearing you say that. You make a point in the world of Plymouth Plantation that to look at it purely as something particularly isolated and on its own misses the the wider picture drastically. Well, I think Plymouth carries a particularly central place in the way the United States thinks about its past. And so doing Plymouth as the place that I wanted to foreground to consider Atlantic connections was a very intentional choice on my part. Instead of, you know, thinking my way through the usual narratives about Plymouth, you know, was was the Mayflower Compact pack this or that, you know, there what how do you analyze the first Thanksgiving? There were kind of established debates that already existed in the scholarship. I just decided to sidestep all of those and think about it in a different way. That is, as a place on the edge of the Atlantic that had all kinds of connections, in spite of our image of it as a kind of isolated outpost that, you know, was kind of trying to go it on its own and struggling along, which it was. But, you know, that's not the whole story and that's not the story that I wanted to tell. So I I intentionally chose it as a place to think about the connection since we so seldom do that with that location. Although it does a lot of work in the national narrative, you know, the kind of myth, the origin myths of the United States. Its connectivity is not part of that work. The main reason I wanted to speak to you today was because of Cromwell's Western design. We will be reaching this soon in the narrative, and I thought it would be fantastic to have you on to talk about it, because it's such a pivotal moment in the early English colonization. So to start with an easy one, what was the Western design? Well, the phrase Western design was intended to imply an, an effort and adventure in the Western uh, reaches, that is, in the Americas. And the term, I think, was coined in order to obscure the details about it. People knew that it was that there was a plan afoot for quite a long time, but they either were not supposed to talk about it or were only speculating about what it was because of the efforts to keep it secret. And therefore, it began to be referred to as the Western design because of this uh, prohibition on on brooding about the plan. Uh, it was an effort by the Cromwellian government to conquer Spanish America. That was the goal. Uh, There were, by this time, many, many decades of conversations that had taken place in England itself about how weak the Spanish were in the Americas, how opposed to their presence were the indigenous people, uh, how ready they and the enslaved African were to rise up against Spain. So there was this sense that the Spanish were extracting huge amounts of wealth, which made it a, an attractive conquest, but at the same time that their hold was very tenuous and that they would be easily displaced. So Cromwell believed this narrative, and as did many others. And so this scheme was put into place to take his triumphs in the three kingdoms and transfer them into the wider Atlantic world with a conquest. He sent out um, a five-man commission to lead it who were directed with working out the details once they got there. They were supposed to get local intelligence on the ground and figure out exactly which spot to hit first. And that was that that instruction made sense in the sense that they thought first they'll take this, then they'll take that, then they'll take the other thing. And it's not as if they were choosing just a place to conquer in strategizing once they arrived. So in that sense, he felt fine about delegating it to people who would 
make those initial choices. Uh, there were various things that went wrong, which I'm happy to talk about, but they eventually sailed toward Hispaniola, which was the largest Spanish island, an important center. Uh, it seemed like a good place to start with. And it had previously been successfully attacked by English mariners in, in an earlier period. So there were there were lots of things to recommend it as a kind of good initial spot to begin their efforts. Uh, they, they fail there rather spectacularly and sail on to Jamaica, which was a much smaller and less attractive island as a kind of, it's often talked about as a sort of consolation prize, but it was also just a place to go and regroup where they felt that they could easily, you know, gain control and therefore have a place that they could take this large and by this time sick force of men who had to be cared for and, you know, propped back up before anything further could be accomplished. Jamaica ends up being all they get out of it, uh, which was obviously not in line with what Cromwell had been hoping when they started out. <laughs> you, you hinted that things went wrong. How early did things go wrong, and and what what happened? Well, there's lots written afterwards about how badly the whole thing was handled from the very beginning, when it's still when preparations are still being made in England, and that's a little bit dangerous to say, but people do say it. The attempt at secrecy created some kinds of impediments to actually doing the work of getting it organized and going. But it was, a, it was a monumental undertaking. It was a lot of ships. It was a lot of men. It was taking a lot of time and a lot of money to get it launched out of England. And uh, raising the men was difficult. Uh, there were complaints afterwards that, you know, standing forces were approached to donate some of their men to the effort. And, of course commanding officers picked the worst of the men they had under their command to include. Uh, so they sent, you know, according to the detractors, they sent all the ne'er-do-wells, the people who were the least uh, capable. Um, other people, other, you know, individuals were identified and taken in the usual way of just grabbing people out of jails or, you know, whatever people came available. So the force itself was, you know, not Cromwell sending his crack forces, even though I think that he, there was some thought that that's what he was doing. It was it was not the organized uh, undertaking that it might have been from the very beginning. There was a lot of trouble with supply in England, so it was eventually decided that they would send what they had to pull together to the island of Barbados, which was going to be a gathering point for the fleet, and that they would, once they were there, they would send on supply ships and the local business that needed to be handled before they could sail would be handled there as they waited for reinforcements and supply. That didn't work as expected. Supply ships never did come. The locals were not as eagerly in support of the scheme as people in England had been told that they would be. They did not like the idea of giving up a large portion of their shrinking Anglo-West Indian population to the effort. There were there, there was attempts to recruit from among the European people living on the island to add to the forces. And because the planters had a large enslaved labor force, they did not want to lose the few um, free European men who were available to help them counter uprisings, et cetera. So there wasn't a lot of support among the planters for the idea that the ex-indentured servants or even current indentured servants would leave the island along with the fleet. They also, Barbados couldn't feed itself at that time. So the idea that you would get things that you needed by going to Barbados was very unrealistic as far as a supply of food was concerned. They imported food in order to feed their enslaved population. 
as well as, you know, importing importing better things in, you know, a luxury food items for the for the elite population. So Barbados was not set up to be supportive or inclined to be supportive. So that created problems, slowed things down, uh, awaiting the supply ships that never came, further slowed things down. So they didn't leave in the best possible circumstances when they sailed away from Barbados as it was. They then had trouble once they finally got to Hispaniola with the landing. They knew that it was possible to land near the city of San Domingo and to make an attack on it, as had been done in the past. But when they got there, the sea was very high. The surf was very rough. The approach seemed treacherous. There was a decision whether surprise was more important than proximity in terms of landing, and they decided that getting the men off the ships and onto the ground to make their way to the city was more important than, you know, hanging back a few days and hoping that the closer approach would become more available to them. That was a bad decision, as it turned out, because the sea did moderate. A landing did become possible closer to the city a little bit later. But in the meantime, they landed the men quite a long hike away with a small amount of uh, provisions and told them to march their way around the bay toward Santo Domingo. The Spanish knew they were coming, of course, and did things like poison the wells, flee with livestock or kill the livestock that they couldn't flee with. So they didn't find a pillageable countryside as they were marching. They quickly began to be ill with drinking bad water. They ate through their provisions very quickly. They did a little bit of stumbling around and getting lost, which seems a little bit difficult to believe, except that they were looking for a crossing for the river. They had difficulty with that. They marched far inland looking for a place, and it ended up taking them more and more time. So by the time they're actually approaching San Domingo, the Spanish have had plenty of time to prepare for the assault. And they were already ill and hungry and dispirited, and they completely failed in their attempt to attack the city. They are ambushed a couple times. They're running away. Some of the troops actually shriek and flee away from the Africans who were attached to their numbers, thinking they were enslaved Africans of the Spanish who were attacking them, which, of course, they had been told would come out to support them. They learned very quickly that the African-descended men living on the island were not, in fact, willing to come and join the English forces right away. In fact, the Spanish had had enough time to call in the uh, hunters who slaughtered the huge herds that roamed in the interior of the island And they used these lances to kill the cattle. And then they harvested the hides, which was a big trade item out of the island. And so these these long lances were used against the troops themselves in the approach to the city. So they were completely unprepared for what they found. They were not in good shape when they got there. They were easily frightened. There were lots of accounts of cowardice, including against the general, uh, Robert Venables, who had a charge of the army. After some time on the island, eight days, I believe, they were camping out near the mouth of the river, starving, drinking befouled water, and enduring abdominal flux and uh, pain. And they were a complete mess. Many of them were dying from these illnesses or from the the injuries that they had received in the in the march toward the city. And so it was decided finally that they had to take the men off and uh, go somewhere else, do something else. Uh, it was, and there were tensions between the Navy, which had been on the ships nearby, and the, and the Army, which had been enduring this eight days of marching around, getting sick and hungry, and then attacked. And so there was, uh, you know, blame from the sailors about the cowardice of the soldiers, and the soldiers were being ill-treated by the sailors. 
when they were boarded on the ships. So the thing was a complete disaster, basically. It was said afterwards that Edward Winslow, who had been actually in Plymouth Plantation from the beginning uh, and had gone then to revolutionary England where he had gotten involved in government affairs and had been sent as a successful colonizer of another part of the English Atlantic as part of the uh, five-man commission that was going to lead the design. And he was, by this time, an older man. And he it was said that when he died on shipboard, sailing away from Española, it was of a broken heart because he was so devastated by the bad account of itself that the English troops had given in this attempted assault against the Spanish island. Again, it's just in, it's very interesting how interconnected this this Atlantic world is. It make it makes perfect sense that one of your projects leads into another, which leads into another, which has come back to the first after the disaster on Hispaniola. The English famously they move on to Jamaica. How did they fare in Jamaica? Why did Jamaica work, whereas Hispaniola did not? <laughs> well. There was some question whether Jamaica worked, <laughs> at least in the short term. But uh, Jamaica was a much smaller island. It was not very developed by the Spanish. It was the last island that the Columbus family held control of. It was left in the hands of the Columbus family when the Habsburgs were pulling back from allowing them to own all the big Spanish islands, which had been the original deal after Columbus had sailed there four times. And his descendant technically owned the island, but didn't do much with it, drew a very modest income from it, never went there, didn't really know exactly what was going on there. And there weren't very many people living there. There wasn't much going on economically or otherwise there. So when the English arrived, there was some advance notice so that the people living in the city, the small, the town that was there, were able to gather up their things and flee. And that would become a kind of standard way for Caribbean islands to defend themselves from intruders because the disease environment would often overtake the new arrivals. And so if the people who lived there could simply get away with their goods, they could hide out somewhere else waiting for illness and hunger to overtake the invading force. So this was an early use of that strategy. They took off and Jamaica is, of course, very mountainous. And so there were lots of places that were less accessible, that you could go, that it would be hard to follow you or find you. So they they basically, they also, the people who lived in the town, if they were wealthy enough, also had households that were, you know, in the, more out in the, in the countryside. So a lot of them initially just retired to their homes that were, you know, elsewhere on the island. Because the English didn't, you know, land and attack right away, this was allowed to happen. So then eventually it went into a parlay about what arrangements were going to be made. The Spanish seemed to have thought that the English were there as in the way that English had come before, which was to attack, to take what they could get their hands on, to, you know, maybe refortify themselves with wood and water and any food they could gather. So they initially thought this is what they were dealing with. That this, they didn't. They didn't imagine that this was an effort to conquer an entire Spanish island. So initially, they were in negotiations about, you know, th- thinking they were going to be asked to bring, you know, this much cattle to be slaughtered and et cetera. But in fact, even though the army did ask for that, they also said, you know, and we're staying, and we expect you to surrender to us. So. Some people were fairly quickly taken off the island and deposited elsewhere. They made agreements with the English to do that. But a big portion of people decided that they wanted to either resist or escape without English aid. They did not trust the English to take them. So they went uh, into the more inaccessible areas, into the mountains, into the forests, and hid themselves from the English. They slowly began ferrying those members of the population who didn't want to stay on the island and mount a resistance off the island uh, to Cuba. So small, small um, vessels were used to ferry people 
the English eventually started patrolling the, for those and captured a few of them and questioned people. But what developed on the island was was basically a war between the people who stayed uh, and were trying to get rid of the English and the English army itself. And that went on for five years. It had various twists and turns. I don't think there was a major maroon community in Jamaica at the time that the English arrived. But I do think that both free Africans, Afro-Spanish residents, and some of the enslaved eventually created their own communities over the course of this five-year period while the English are trying to conquer the island completely away from the Spanish. So there end up being these independent, well-organized African communities hidden in various parts of the island that are resisting the English, but in some cases also resisting the Spanish, uh, according to what the English learned, and attempting to be independent of everyone else who's on the island and make their own way. The Spanish leader of the resistance claims that he commands authority over them, but the events don't entirely bear that out. In any case, eventually, uh, and finally, in the end, with the help of one of these maroon communities, the Spanish themselves are driven off the island, and an agreement is made between the English and the these communities of Africans that the African community can be independent of English authority and live alongside it without facing enslavement or banishment off the island. So by 1660, that's the kind of status quo that's been achieved, and it's only then that the English can make a reasonable statement of having conquered Jamaica. And they do so basically just in time for the restoration. So it's not even in the end, you know, I mean, Cromwell's been dead by that time for a couple of years, but it's not even in the end something that Cromwell gets the full benefit of. And this deal with the Maroon community does that continue or do does yes. the new restoration okay i wondered if the new restoration government came in and said oh that was a deal with the previous regime they were all rebels and traitors no actually there are um there there's evidence that there is actually a black um a set of black troops that are under the authority of one of the um african men juan de bolo uh, and that he is actually working with the English in the restoration to find other maroon communities. So they they made this deal and they are trying to work together while keeping their independence from uh, from the English government. And there are a couple of two or three maroon communities in the restoration era that are living on the island. I don't know if you've ever been to Jamaica, but it is very mountainous. And there are, I mean, you only have to glance at it to to see how easy it would be to have, you know, a group of people living somewhere in the mountains without anyone, you know, readily finding your location. In fact, it's it's stumbling upon the location of the one community that allows the English to basically blackmail them and to I mean they say we will burn down your your crops and your buildings if you don't assist us and they I think I was struck when I when I read the description of what they found in the mountains that this community of free and formerly enslaved uh, African descended people were probably the best fed, fed people on Jamaica in 1659, 1660, because they were, you know, competent to grow their own food. They had access to the livestock that roamed around. They knew the plants that were edible, you know, the fruits that they could harvest, et cetera. So I think they had been eating quite a bit better than the, than the troops themselves had been because supply remained a problem throughout the whole period. That is 
very interesting. I didn't realise there was this surviving Maroon community. And the Spanish pre-existing settlers, did all of them leave by the end, or were some of them integrated into English rule? Uh, no, 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 none of them that I know of were integrated into the English uh, community. There was differences of religion, of language... Uh, the English will eventually try to come to some kind, or some of them will try to come to some kind of accommodation with the Spanish in the region, you know, trade accommodations and that sort of thing. But in the initial phase, no. The agreement in the end when they defeat the Spanish forces is that everyone will be removed. And there is actually a neighborhood in Santiago in Cuba that is basically the Jamaican refugee neighborhood after I think some of the initial departing people go there and then as other people join it grows and grows and then finally this last group comes with the complete conquest of the island and they become a a kind of identifiable group in Cuba of related people who had been together on Jamaica. So again, we see more connections in this Atlantic world that you wouldn't necessarily expect. This episode is brought to you by Reese's Peanut Butter Cups. In breaking news, leading scientists worldwide are conducting experiments to determine if Reese's Peanut Butter Cups are the perfect combination of peanut butter and chocolate. However, it appears the study was inconclusive as the scientists couldn't help but eat all the Reese's. Because when you want something sweet, you can't do better than Reese's. Find Reese's now at a store near you. The regular season is heating up. New stars are emerging, and that means more opportunities to win up to 25 times your cash on prize picks. The most exciting way to play daily fantasy sports. Just select two or more players, pick more or less on their projection on a wide variety of stats, and place your entry. It's that easy. Let it fly to turn $10 into $250 with just a few taps. Easy gameplay, quick withdrawals, and injury insurance on your picks are what make prize picks the number one daily fantasy sports app. Watch your favorite players and get paid doing it this basketball season. See your entries make progress during the game or make new entries for the second half in the fourth quarter. Three-pointers, assists, rebounds, and everything in between are yours for the taking. Join the prize picks community of more than 7 million players who have already signed up. Right now, Prize Picks will match your first deposit of up to $100. Just download the Prize Picks app and use code GET100. That's code GET100 on Prize Picks for a first deposit match of up to $100. Prize Picks, pick more, pick less. It's that easy. Now, famously, Jamaica becomes almost usurps Barbados as the engine of empire of, of the English Empire in the Caribbean driven by enslaved labor. How does that come about? That's a long, slow process, actually. It's not really until the 18th century that it becomes a big sugar and slave behemoth. Initially, well, there's still a kind of militant group on the island that thinks the war, the ongoing war with the Spanish, the fact that the Spanish don't want them there, is a good reason to keep up the warfare that because even though the conquering of the actual island had not been very successful, the Navy had been busy in the region since arriving, attacking various settlements. Um, the English took over Tortuga for a while and ruled it. You know, they had launched various attacks against different Spanish locations over the course of the previous few years. And some people thought, you know, there was no reason to stop that kind of of interaction. Other people thought, well, if we can make peace with the Spanish, which eventually does in fact happen, we could begin trading with them and that that would be more profitable. And initially, Jamaica's big involvement with uh, slavery was less in employing the slaves themselves and more in transshipping them to Spanish locations where they there was big demand for enslaved Africans, and the English are perfectly happy to try to fulfill that. That being said, it's difficult for the English to settle Jamaica. It gets a bad reputation, not surprisingly, given these early years. Cromwell's efforts to recruit settlers from other locations, which he energetically and optimistically enters into, sending agents around to talk to various people and various other colonial outposts, pretty much of a failure. There's a group that comes from Nevis that 
basically, in spite of already being island residents and supposedly acclimated to the area, many of them die after they arrive, including the governor who had led the the group that uh, removed to Jamaica. So it's it's a long, slow process to actually get any English bodies. And one thing they do is they decide that they're going to basically not let the army go home. The <laughs> army is going to stay and become the first workers of the land. And they had already begun that because they divided the men, the various companies of men up into different parts of the island, in part to hold it, also in part because they thought not all, you know, living all close together, they could improve the health of the individual units. But they began to have, as part of their military duty, basically farming, which is not popular. And they have to, the soldiers actually have to farm the land as part of their military duty, which is a way to get around the problem of a lack of provisions being sent out. When the transition is made to civil society after the Restoration, the men are actually given, like the former soldiers are actually given small plots and the officers larger plots. So they actually start settling Jamaica in part that way. There is a group that comes from Barbados, and they come with knowledge about slavery and ideas about creating slave plantation, sugar plantations, employing enslaved labor. But they don't, they don't get much done of that work in the initial period. Uh, there are a lot of impediments, and the economy remains rather mixed. There are cocoa walks there, which are actually much prized as a piece of land for officers to be given. So they are exporting that and educating English consumers what to do with chocolate because it was <laughs> not familiar to them in the same way that it was in, by this time in Spain. In fact, I ran across a ship that takes a Spanish prize and it's full of the beans, the cocoa beans, and they say, well, this is useless. What do we do with this? And I start just pitching it overboard. <laughs> <laughs> it's like, this is not, you know, in the end, this is not what they would have done once they figured out what they were, what they should have been doing. But, <laughs> but at the time, they just didn't have the knowledge. It takes some time for Jamaica to turn toward the really large investment in slavery and, and large scale plantation labor. And that work, you know, it's slow and it, it's underway by the 1670s, but it's not really, it doesn't really become the dominant or even a large part of what the, is bringing uh, profit into the island coffers until the late uh, 17th century. And Jamaica is not set up to be entirely taken over by sugar in any case. The mountainous areas are better for coffee, they eventually discover. They do keep the cocoa walks. They, so it, it always has a bit more of a mixed agricultural base than what we envision. But it does become, in the 18th century, very valuable, very profitable. The big engine of, you know, English sugar production is Jamaica by that time. And it, and it becomes the most valuable colony until India, <laughs> you know, becomes more important to the British so at the time, how what was the reaction back in Europe to to the whole to the whole process? Like the news is filtering back, I'm assuming, and the first news is bad news, at least for the English, that oh, everyone's dying. <laughs> but then there's better news of conquering Jamaica, and then that becomes this grinding anti guerrilla war, essentially, by the sound of it. How does the rest of Europe react? I'm I'm thinking specifically not just in England, but the Spanish, who you know are now very much at war with England uh, and and the Commonwealth, but also the Dutch, because England has only recently just been at war with them, competing over colonial interests. I'm I'm curious how how were they reacting to all this? Well, there's a lot of interest in what is Cromwell up to as he's pulling together the fleet and the men and the provisions, and there's lots of spying attempted and efforts to keep the information about what their goals are, what their intentions are out of uh, public view so that their enemies won't know. They do try to cause people to believe they're going somewhere else, <laughs> you know, but the kinds of provisions that are getting loaded are actually looked at and analyzed and discussed in terms of, oh, looks like a tropical climate, looks like a far, fairly far distance, this kind of you know, news is getting 
passed around. The first news to come back from the Caribbean is actually super positive. There are reports that must have been generated by passing merchant ships that the English flag was flying above Española. They initially, you know, the very first news is that they've successfully conquered this island. And then gradually it trickles back that, no, they were repulsed there and they went on to Jamaica. And then there's a big effort to make Jamaica sound better than it was (laughs) <laughs> they, there's lots of pamphlet literature and letters that are being sent back and forth and produced that are describing everything the island is and everything it can be. In fact, a, a funny moment in my research came when I realized that when the Columbus heir was complaining that the Spanish had not defended as they had promised to do his holdings in Jamaica, but it allowed the English to take it. He wants to list what he lost as a result of this neglect on their part, but he doesn't know anything about the island, really. So what he does is he gets an English pamphlet describing the great thing they seized and gets it translated into Spanish. (laughs) I mean, he doesn't acknowledge it. He doesn't have a citation, but he takes the text, basically word for word, as the description of what a great island this is and all the things that are there and all the potential that it has so that he can then make the case that the Spanish owe him for what he's lost. So there's a big PR push to make it into a positive. But, of course, the news of what had happened on Hispaniola, in particular the the accusations of cowardice against Venables, various things that are being said mean that Some heads have to roll, like someone has to pay for this. And people don't want to stay in Jamaica because everyone is sick. And William Penn, who is Sir William Penn, who was the head of the naval forces, decides that their work is done, that he can leave a smaller naval force there under one of his vice admirals, William Goodson, and that he can go home with a large number of the ships, which he really shouldn't keep occupied in the Caribbean, he says you know, endlessly because Cromwell needs them at home. And Venables is supposed to stay, but he's very ill. And he uses that as a reason, maybe as an excuse, to be carried on board ship and taken back as well. So a lot of the senior men, the men who are well-connected with the army, leave, and many men in the Navy leave. And so when they get back, Cromwell has both Penn and Venables thrown into the tower. Penn apologizes and explains himself and gets out pretty quickly, but Venables is left there for quite a while, writes a long relation, defending himself, which is a gold mine of information about what went on, and is finally in disgrace but allowed to be released and basically retires to his country estate and never does anything else, you know, of a of a public nature. I think later on he publishes a book about fishing, like one of these angler books or, you know, it's just something very much the country gentleman. From there, then Cromwell tries to do damage control. But unfortunately for him, a lot of these people who've come back are telling the story of how badly it went, are suggesting that the lack of supply ships, the poor quality of the men sent, various things that could be laid at Cromwell's door were part of the problem, which, of course, he doesn't love. So he he actually does things to suppress the information, like close the press and basically tries to put a gag order on all these discussions and to tell people that they're not supposed to to talk about what went on. And part of the reason to keep the army there, besides the fact that they don't have good control of the island yet, is to keep more men from coming back and talking about the conditions and what went on, et cetera. So, you know, there's a big effort to keep the news of it suppressed. But of course, the Europeans do find out, are aware that this island has been taken. The Dutch 
don't react in a big way that I was able to discern. I mean, they know it's happening. They give the island a wide berth while the Navy is there. Eventually, they start trading there or stopping there. Technically, because of the Navigation Act of 1651, they're not allowed to trade with the English islands. And in fact, the whole Western design fiasco starts off from their point of view with the seizure of a lot of Dutch and other ships that were trading illegally at Barbados. Just one of the first things the fleet does when it arrives is and takes all these traders from Northern Europe who are not supposed to be trading in the English islands and seizes their 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 vessels and their cargoes. So the Dutch are giving it, a, you know, in the Caribbean are giving Jamaica a wide berth. And in Europe, they're just like everybody else kind of sitting back to wait and see what will happen. There's a very large expectation when the Stuarts are restored, that the island will be handed back to the Spanish. And there was negotiations that if the Spanish helped Charles to take the throne, he would give it back to them. But in the end, he doesn't use them, and he certainly doesn't honor any kind of agreement he may have hinted that he was going to make because he decides to hang on to it, but at the same time negotiates a a treaty with the Spanish, which doesn't name places, but it basically says um, everybody gets to keep what they have at the moment. And so that basically, in effect, gives Jamaica over to the English. And later the English will argue that it also gives them the logwood harvesting area in Belize because there were men illegally camped out there harvesting logwood that the treaty was signed. I'm guessing the Spanish didn't go for that. Uh, well, Belize doesn't eventually end up being English, but <laughs> there's a lot of water under that bridge in the meantime. Yes, it's, uh, it's an embarrassment for Cromwell. It's treated as a crisis of the protectorate that he finds out about this bad news and has to think, you know, what is God trying to tell me by allowing this defeat? You know, obviously he doesn't like the Spanish because they're Catholic and he does like us because we're Protestant and because he's given us all these victories in the past. So what was wrong? And he does, I mean, there's a good Blair Warden article about this from some years back where he talks about the different ways in which you could analyze the providential message of this disaster and you know what is it that you're what is it that you're being told by the failure not good news for venables is part of what you're being told you know because it's uh unfit leadership is part of the is part of the explanation that cromwell settles on although not himself so much as those under him so other other than other than getting the right leadership and keeping god on side what influence does the western design have on the future of english and then british imperialism because we're we're looking at a large state venture we're talking about amphibious invasions that become almost the bread and butter of expansion from the british state yes well those are points that i make that it, in the book that it is actually much more important the historiography was that it was an embarrassing failure that it was one of the things that went wrong for the protectorate in this phase. I mean, the way that it had been talked about, which in fact was not much in British historiography at the time that I was publishing, was in those kinds of terms. And there wasn't a lot on the Caribbean side in terms of the scholarship at the time that I started either. There was, you know, a few articles about the Spanish resistance. There was one island resident who wrote a history of the military elements, which I greatly appreciated because he clearly knew the like the events on the ground very intimately and described them in a lot of detail. He also wrote a bad novel about, you know, set in the Cromwellian army featuring one of his ancestors, you know, I think in a somewhat heroic position, et cetera. But there just wasn't a lot about this as as a big moment, as anything consequential, you know, except in the problems confronting the protectorate. But I think, as you said, that the amphibious invasion piece of this is big and important for like thinking ahead to England and then Britain as a naval power, the kinds of wars that will later be fought 
in the Caribbean and in, uh, you know and in other locations I think it's a important precursor to some of that I think also it's really important for how it changes the map of the Caribbean if you think about the fact that the English and the French and the Dutch all these other groups had been clinging to the outer edge of the Caribbean in the less attractive smallest islands that the Spanish had not done anything with that basically tacitly had been left to them after some initial efforts on the part of the Spanish to drive out any kinds of settlers. They just, you know, agreed that, okay, you can be over here on the edge where there's nothing really important going on and we will stay here and the rest of it and, you know, control the waterways. And as long as you don't try to intrude on the more central ground, we'll have a kind of uneasy, unofficial truce. Uh, The obvious exception to this had been Providence Island Company's effort to take, you know, and hold an island in the basically off coast of Central America that the Spanish would not put up with, attacked three times and eventually completely destroyed the, you know, the English effort there. But from then in 1641, when that had been removed until almost 15 years later, when the when the English take Jamaica, this truce had held where the big islands, the waterway, the valuable stuff, the passage for the convoys going out with the silver were all controlled by the Spanish, and they allowed these other groups to be kind of in marginal areas off to the side. But Jamaica means suddenly that the English are in the middle of the Spanish Caribbean, and they use it as a as a foothold, not only eventually to develop plantation agriculture of a sort that the Spanish themselves are not into at the at the time. I mean, the Spanish aren't big into sugar until much later, uh, but also to you know use it as a base of operations for contraband trade, legal trade when they get hold of the asiento and have the contract for trading with enslaved Africans to the Spanish lands. They use it as a a base to make war on the Spanish, either officially during wartime, but also unofficially when there's various conflicts in the region that arise out of the overly exuberant (laughs) efforts of first the Navy and then the privateers who are in the area. So it makes a huge difference, I think, geopolitically. Tortuga, the island off the coast of Española, had been occasionally used up to that time by various people, and the Spanish had been wiping out effort to settle on Tortuga. The English renew those during this period, and unfortunately for them, they set up a government that is headed by a Frenchman who's supposedly their ally and underling, who then turns it over to France later so that Tortuga is lost to the English, and the French then have a foothold in the center of the Caribbean, which they will use to then move on to the area of the island of Española, which leads to them eventually, you know, by the end of the century, having control of an acknowledged claim to half of that island. You know, what is today Haiti got out of Spanish hands and into French hands as a result of these events that get started during this period. So I think it's really important in terms of, you know, loosening the Spanish control, introducing these other European powers into the center of the Caribbean. And of course, this will become a big site of of warfare in later periods. After the Western design, European wars overflow into the Caribbean routinely, whereas they hadn't before that. The next Anglo-Dutch war has elements of it fought in the Caribbean, and it just goes on from there. So the the you know, if the Caribbean is as as was said, famously said, the cockpit of Europe, it in part becomes that because of, you know, these this shifting geopolitics that the Western design contributes so much toward. It also means that the English now have a lot of potentially valuable land in the Caribbean itself, as opposed to the small islands that they had had up to this time. And that shifts their you know, their interests toward that region more than in North America, which had been, you know, struggling along and 
doing a little bit, but not not looking to be especially profitable or interesting as a place to, to establish colonies. So it definitely becomes, Jamaica definitely becomes central to the British Atlantic as eventually the most valuable colony, but also just as a place where more, you know, that, that appears to be more important for a variety of reasons. Fantastic. Well, I, I could ask you questions about this for hours. It's such a fascinating topic. Professor Pastana, thank you so much for speaking with me today. You're very welcome. Thanks again to Professor Pastana for taking the time to speak with me. If you're interested in reading her work on the English conquest of Jamaica, then I'd recommend picking up The English Conquest of Jamaica. I've also found her book on the colonial reaction to the Wars of the Three Kingdoms very useful for the podcast, and that is called The English Atlantic in an Age of Revolution. A third book that is highly readable and very entertaining is The World of Plymouth Plantation. I read it cover to cover, not because I needed to for research, but because it was just so interesting and well written. The full titles of all three are in the description of the episode, and you can find them everywhere you'd find history books. The regular season is heating up. New stars are emerging, and that means more opportunities to win up to 25 times your cash on prize picks. The most exciting way to play daily fantasy sports. Just select two or more players, pick more or less on their projection on a wide variety of stats, and place your entry. It's that easy. Let it fly to turn $10 into $250 with just a few taps. Easy gameplay, quick withdrawals, and injury insurance on your picks are what make Prize Picks the number one daily fantasy sports app. Watch your favorite players and get paid doing it this basketball season. See your entries make progress during the game or make new entries for the second half in the fourth quarter. Three pointers, assists, rebounds, and everything in between are yours for the taking. Join the Prize Picks community of more than 7 million players who have already signed up. Right now, Prize Picks will match your first deposit of up to $100. Just download the Prize Picks app and use code GET100. That's code GET100 on Prize Picks for a first deposit match of up to $100. Prize Picks, pick more, pick less, it's that easy.